instead of repeating the same soup, I revised my title and I decided to go ahead to revisions of cranial cervical fusion since I did it twice this week and uh, was fresh in my mind. And I thought, okay, why don't I share this experience about these strange cases to a point that they're going to have some teaching points for everybody. Um, last, um, a few weeks ago, uh, a few months ago, uh, there was an article which came out in literature and through PubMed uh, spread uh, quite the panic among the among our patient population. And uh, it was an article from a group in Turkey which had a quite elevated complication rate. So all of a sudden, the uh, old fears of craniocervical fusion being this uh, horrible pathology uh, with, sorry, a horrible complex, horrible surgery, which is complication ridden. Oh my God, you know, this is going to be the last thing before death's door. Fortunately, uh, there was an article that, this article was about 128 patients. So fortunately, a few weeks later, uh, we ended up uh, having an article which was already uh, accepted uh, in October, but ended up being published and being on PubMed. And fortunately, the complication rates were not as high. Demonstrating that if you are, you know, the, the more, it is like everything, like tying your shoes. The more you do, the better you get. So the reality is that if you go in places where the craniocervical fusions are done more frequently than once a month, obviously you're going to arrive the benefits of being exposed to less complications. So um, this is not just to brag because you know we're, we're special this is just the common experience of everybody who does an average of four three four kind of cervical fusions a month they, they can get those kind of numbers all right what are the top three problems that people with cranial cervical fusions can have especially in our patient population the first one is metal fatigue. Second is painful profile. The third one is next level disease. Um, these complications are similar to the complications that uh, can be experienced by patients in trauma or who had some kind of uh, degenerative inflammatory or neoplastic disease of the cervical uh, joint. But People with carry one malformation and people and or EDS, they have a particular flavor to each and any one of these three categories. The first one is definitely the metal fatigue. The concept of cranial cervical fusion is that you have to have hardware to fix a joint, but hardware by itself doesn't work well uh, and has to be reinforced by bone. Bone which, with the help of a framework that we created at the time of the, of the surgery, bone which is deposed by the patient cells. Um, the reality is that patients with Chiari and patients with Chiari and EDS especially have a pathetic bone metabolism. So you throw everything plus the kitchen sink and the degree of uh, bony reinforcement which should be provided by the patient, you, you guys are so lazy, uh, or at least your cells are, uh, is very suboptimal and I'm going to be very, you know, uh, very optimistic about it. Uh, very often uh, there is nothing at all. So what happens? What happens is that these pillars, which should be made of armor cement, you know, the metal plus the cement, in this case, the metal plus the bone, is just naked uh, metal over some of the uh, segments which are more stress mechanically. And after a while, they become like a um, like a paperclip. The more you play with it, the more the paperclip becomes soft and eventually it can even break. So that is something which happens more often in people with uh, in people with Chiari and EDS. The other problem is that if somebody had the former Chiari decompression, a lot of bone of the posterior fossa is being removed, especially the prized. Um, bone which is in the middle where the bone is the thickest so you have some problems uh, about where to anchor the uh, the bar plates which are you know the attachment in the back of the skull 
And so you have to, in order to chase for bone, you have to have a longer span or a twisted bar plate, and that exposes to even more metal fatigue. Second problem is definitely the painful profile. Uh, you guys are like the princess and the pea. So um, why do I say that? A patient with, uh, well, my dog is saying hi to everybody. Um, the problem is that if you have uh, a trauma patient who comes to you with a broken neck or sublux neck and you do a craniosurgical fusion, on the way out is going to kiss your hands, your feet, and whatever. A patient with carry and you know yes. Uh, after a craniosurgical fusion in the aftermath of a posterior fossa decompression, et cetera, because they, uh, they're exposed, predisposed to death, but not everybody with carry end up with a craniosurgical fusion. Just want to make it clear again, um, just in rare circumstances. But people with carry and EDS, you do the craniosurgical fusion, you put the bar plate in the back of the skull, and then they come back after three, six, nine months, and they say, yeah, I'm better, but this thing is bothering me so much that I want to rip it off. And again, the prince concept, the princess and the, and the pea, uh, your tissues are more touchy-feely for everything which is immediately underneath the skin and attached to the bone, and there is not a lot of soft tissue padding, uh, you know, creates discomfort. Next level disease means what? Uh, we fuse somebody at any point in, in uh, the spine, good, we, we solve the problem, but the joints above and below, they now they get more uh, mechanically stressed. It is like a teeter-totter in which on one side there is the obese kid and on the other side there is the skinny kid. Um, and uh, so the teeter-totter now is a little bit more uneven in distribution of forces. So what happens is that uh, people who already have loose joints you fuse the joint that is defective and you accelerate the process of uh, degeneration and wear and tear in the joint below. So eventually in somebody, but not in everybody, just a minority of people, fortunately, uh, even despite aggressive conservative management, you end up having uh, a failure of the joint below and then you're going to have to extend the fusion. This happens in a minority of patients. All right. Uh, so these are the principles, and this is an example on the left of uh, how a bar can break. You see in the picture on the bottom on the left, uh, the broken bar, and uh, the picture on the top on the left, you barely see it, but in the reconstruction, you see the clear cut. That is a problem. You cannot leave the patient like that because otherwise the broken shard can actually penetrate the door and create problems. Um, since 2011, I, I use a different kind of fusion configuration, which is the, called the condylar screw construct. What's the difference? The picture on the left shows you a very long construct, which is about 15 to 18 centimeters in length, while that, that one on the left is about three centimeters to three centimeters and a half in length. Uh, and What's the problem? What's the advantage? The advantage is that a straight bar is more resilient than a bent bar. And uh, because the bent bar has to follow the, the profile of the skull in the neck. And the other issue is that the shorter the construct is, the more easy for your defective bone metabolism to do the job of covering the bone fusion. All right, let's go to the fun part. Case number one. His number one was a patient with a typical, uh, typical problem, EDS person, uh, young girl. She developed a lot of problems of uh, uh, weakness from swallowing, blurred vision, uh, a shortness of breath, very, very sick. Uh, she ended up being fused by one of my colleagues. And uh, the job is perfect in terms of hardware, very, very good. Uh, the, the, screw, the screws extend all the way to the thoracic spine because she kept failing. And uh, she came back with more problems. So we were trying to figure out what the problem was in her case. Um, problem number one, in this case, 
was she went for surgery because she was having uh, a basal impression which was compounded by hypermobility so that odontoid which was crooked bank or, uh, backwards not only was touching the brainstem but it was also banging against it like a uh, like a window in the in the breeze and that was creating a progressive problem with the lower medulla um, Going back to the picture, you can see one of the problems here, not the problem of how the fusion was done, but the problem that you guys tend to have. Um, the upper part is the where the fusion gets anchored to the skull. And as you see, goes, there is a little bit of thickness to it because not only you have to have the screws going inwards, but you also have to have the attachment from the outside. Um, it is not it's the way that you know the companies give you the, the hardware. It's not so much you can do it. Just designing a set of hardware is a very time-consuming, bureaucratically written, extremely expensive process. So there are not so many systems out there, and it's one of the best which are around, commercially available. Again, uh, somebody with uh, trauma or with rheumatoid arthritis tolerates the profile of that upper part of the hardware very well. In this case, the poor girl, it was like she was having something stabbing her in the back. So she was not tolerating the hardware, not because she was a wuss, but because the way that's the way that, uh, uh, that the innervation behaves uh, in, in people with EDS. Now, what was the problem here? We, we figure out after a while it was not a problem with the hardware uh, in, the, in terms of anchoring. There was no metal fatigue. Uh, the screws were in excellent position, all of them. There was an excellent bone fusion. Uh, and, uh, you know, nothing was broken. Everything was good. The only problem was the angle between the skull and the neck. So the angle between the skull and the neck was a little bit in flexion. And by doing that was interfering with, uh, you know, try to, I'm going to go for a, into extreme, try to tuck your chin onto your chest. And in that position, try to swallow a steak, you're going to have some problems. So this was, again, you know, a, an example, a, a force example for what she was having. So the decision was that one of repositioning uh, the head uh, in black over here, in dark black, you see the airways. The airway was were a problem for intubation, etc. So what we decided to do was to uh, break the fusion to reposition the patient with the head a little bit more forward and extend it upwards, and to restart. And this is an interoperative picture, so you see that. On the left side, you see just the screws without bars passing through it. So we disarticulated the top part. And you see how we started. And uh, the, there is a tube, the tube, the endotracheal tube, which is that C-shaped um, picture which goes above the teeth and goes down towards the throat. And it's a very tight angle. Uh, it took... Uh, it took a couple of hours for the anesthesiologist to do an intubation, and we went very close to do a tracheostomy. Now, this is the CXA, uh, which is marked over there. It is the angle between the skull and the neck, and it is 134 degrees. So what did we have to do to achieve this at the end? You see that the C now is more gentle compared to this. So the endotracheal tube now has a... Um, has an angle which is more compatible and more easy to be to be managed by any anesthesiologist in condition of emergency. And the angle went from 134 to 154. So what did we have to go through to get there? Uh, the first thing we had to go through was to remove the bars, to correct the bars, and then to break the fusion which is the column of bone, which is in, on the right part of the picture. And we want to do it between the base of the skull and the first vertebra, trying not to try to respect the integrity of the vertebral artery. It's not that difficult. You know, it is, it, it is a mouthful to say it, 
um, but it is not it is not that difficult once you learn a couple of tricks. So now we have the hardware is no longer a problem. We remove the bone that the body has produced there to uh, reinforce the hardware. Then we tried to move the skull and we couldn't. So what was the problem? The problem was that um, the joint between the skull and the first vertebra uh, that is just uh, trying to All right, so which is the, you see that black, uh, those black, dark black signals immediately to the right, that's a joint between the base of the skull called the condyle and the first vertebra. Fortunately, because of the technique I use all the time, which is called the condylar screws, uh, I am in that place very often, but in the back part of it. So what I found out was that the entire joint was frozen shot by bone fusion, which is an excellent result for the surgery, unfortunately was fighting with our attempt to move the head. So I drilled all the way from the back of the joint to the front of the joint, which is practically in the back of your throat and uh, back of the nose actually. And, uh, and then I was able to disarticulate the skull and we were able to achieve this. Then at the end, you know, you put the screws back, you add the condylar screws since you're there, and, uh, and it is not difficult. But this is the, this is the point number one of uh, doing the fusion, doing a craniosurgical fusion requires a lot of attention to details that, um, you know, sometimes even in the best of hands or whatever, you can have a situation like this, and you are not stuck with the fusion forever. It's not like an irreversible situation. But in you know, in the hands of uh, like in the past, you know, all the craniosurgical fusion which were having problems or they were difficult to execute, they were going to Dr. Menezes. And uh, practically, he was himself and just a couple of others during in the entire nation. Now, fortunately, there is a larger uh, population of. of people like Dr. Menezes who have a big experience. So craniosurgical fusion with problem can be redone. Now, this is a kind of a extreme strange case that I, that I tell you simply because after a while you're gonna, guys are gonna get bored of things which are looking over and over. And it was also kind of uh, strange for me. Um, this was a classic, um, Chiari variant called complex Chiari in the, uh, in the terminology of Dr. Brockmeyer um, is a combination of a Chiari 1 malformation plus a uh, congenital malformation in the cranial cervical joint. So we have a buzzer invagination and a deep Chiari 1 malformation. All right, that's a very stimulating case. It's one of those cases that keep you on the toes. This is a detail. You see the CXA, which should be more than 135, ideally should be more than 145. In this case, 115. Very tight place. The brainstem is getting it from, getting pinched from the back and from the front. Very exciting case. It's one of those cases that you get up in the morning and uh, you're really excited for. Um, this is a bone anatomy in that area. And this is the bone anatomy in 3D CT. So, What's the, what's the story here? The story here is that you have to remove the back of the skull. And as you remove the back of the skull to do your Kerrigan malformation, you know that uh, the parts which of the skull which remain accessible for the cranial cervical fusion are going to be very thin. And by being very thin uh, on the side, they're going to they're gonna play against your attempt to anchoring the fusion. Other thing is that Chiari loves to remove bone, the fusion likes to preserve and to add bone. So it's kind of the two efforts are going in different directions. So um, a, a colleague of mine, very experienced in this surgery, and uh, he did the Chiari malformation surgery. He did some shrinking of the tonsils, large duroplasty, and adequate size craniectomy. And he came out with this arrangement of craniocervical fusion 
the details of which are present here. So put the screws in C2, C1, and anchor in the back of the skull. Here's another example of one of those custom, oh, my dog is making a mess, custom available um, fusion kits, which are, uh, which, which are available now. Very nice kit, very smooth. It doesn't have sharp edges. Um, very often not very tolerated. The higher you go on the back of the skull, the less soft tissue there is. In this case, brilliant configuration of the fusion because it's very difficult to have uh, to have a C2, C1 a screw configuration and to be able to anchor it to the hardware. Uh, I tell you, it's, it's difficult. So that's the demonstration my colleague was very good. This is in the aftermath of the carry surgery. So the C1 was uh, open, so laminectomy. He removed the least amount of possible of skull, not to sabotage his own cranial cervical fusion. He was able to have a very good decompression, as you see here. Uh, there was a residual, uh, but less impaction of the brainstem in the front, and the patient already knew that uh, there was going to be the for the probability uh, of a transoral odontoidectomy. In the past cases like this, all of them they were getting a transoral odontoidectomy and then a fusion afterwards. Right now, the, the thing is different. You do first the fusion, you try to extend and extract the, 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 head, the head of the spine as much as you can. And only in a few cases, you end up having a uh, transoral odontoidectomy uh, in the aftermath, after this after. So patient came to me and I ended up doing the transoral odontoidectomy. Good. The brainstem was decompressed from the front. We we're in good shape, but something caught my attention back then, which was a trajectory of this white worm, which is visible on the right. This is a transverse cut, which is a minor cut, which was the vertebral artery of the left side. So very interesting, it's kind of very medial, and it was creating a groove on the brainstem, as we're going to see. And this is a three-dimensional reconstruction. You can see the bar, and you can see now the yellow worm, which goes from the left to the center. So I'm keeping an eye on it. The patient is better after the, after the fusion, but then she starts developing a weakness in the arm, and then quite quickly progresses, something like two, three months after the surgery, to a dense paralysis, which was like in tech, technicality we say, which is one to two out of five when you can just flinch a little bit of a movement, you cannot lift up the, the limb. And so what we started doing was to get more mapping. This is the same artery seen from the top. This is seen from the back. And this what was the what we're dealing with. Uh, the, the were, what was the limitation of accessing this artery to getting off the brainstem? Number one is, is tight space. Number two is to get from the left to the right, you have the bar of the fusion in between. And that yellow thing in the uh, center, looking like a revert, inverted comma, is just a calcification within the duroplasty. Very often they they appear, but not to, of this size, which was obviously limiting the dural opening, at least the direction of dural opening. Uh, now you see the brainstem in the middle, the two um, tonsils in the, in the lower part of the screen. And on the right side of the brainstem, you see the dark spot. And as we move, the dark spot gets closer and closer to the brainstem. It creates a dent. Now, the part where it creates a dent here is so-called the pyramidal tract. And uh, the pyramidal tract is in charge of your uh, movements for the, here we are beside this decusation, so it's in charge of the same movement on the same side of the body. And the more on the side you are, the more towards the arm you are. So here we're having a left-sided compression of the pyramidal tract. And the patient was developing a uh, progressive uh, dense paralysis of the left arm. So we have here something which is called a um, microvascular compression. So you not only have a, a groove, but you have a groove by an object, which is a vertebral artery, which keeps beating. 
It is like being touched by somebody, say, who wants your attention. If the finger stays there and stays still is one thing, but somebody does like this and knows you more. So what, what did I do? Um, I went in and I removed the bar on the left side. Uh, removing the bar on the left side gave me more space to make a cut on the dura on the left side of that calcification. Then I went in and here, here because the MRI and the cuts can they invert, so follow me. Uh, now they, what was on the left is now on the right. I followed the, the artery all the way to this point, but first I had to uh, cut away the tonsil on the left. And then I reached the vertebral artery, I lifted away off the brainstem, and I put some buffer inside, which is called Teflon. You practically just some, put some kind of insulating material just to prevent that uh, artery to, to beat against the, the brainstem. And within 24 hours, the patient was, uh, was able to move the arm almost to normality. All right, so what is, the, what is the lesson here? The lesson here is uh, even if everything is uh, perfectly done in terms of fusion and quote unquote, you forget, you forget something inside uh, in the sense that uh, Chiari surgery needs some extra, extra lobe in hand, it can be done. It's not impossible. My, my dog says hi, say hi to my dog. Um, the, the other thing is, if the craniocervical fusion has a problem, it can be redone. Um, the craniocervical fusions, they are not, they don't have a high complication rate if you go in the center, and there are many in the United States where uh, there are, you know, where, where people do it over and over. There are many people who are either fellowship trained in spine or they develop a, uh, you know, a, a, in experience on their own, like myself. Um, other thing to remember is people with Chiari, because of the former decompression, uh, raise technical problems uh, that, uh, you know, people who have been trained for trauma they haven't encountered before, but, you know, after you get hit on the face uh, three or four times as a surgeon, you learn fast. And then there are some technicalities and uh, nuances linked to, uh, EDS instability that needs to be remembered before tackling patients like this. So bottom line, craniocervical fusion is not easy like uh, removing a tooth, but is not, is not so complicated. Experience can, can be a major equalizer and can be a, a major, you know, safety, safety net. And, uh, and now with more experience around, and your confusion can be redone, and, uh, and it's, it's not that complicated. Okay, so but don't uh, just for the patients, don't try to do it at home because it's, you're, you're not clear yet. Okay, thank you very much. Wonderful, wonderful presentation, Paolo. Thank you very much for for sharing it with us. <clears throat> now we know that there's no limit on number of screws and. As long as you have a good bone, you can hold things together. Yeah, and, and also the bone can be optimized. Uh, number one is you can, um, if the patient has a rotten diet, you can improve the bone by you know, stopping eating Cheetos. Uh, right nowadays, there are a lot of, before it was just Fosamax. Now there are, we saw Fosamax and Forteo. There are two additional medications that can be given to the patient to increase, uh, to increase their, their, you know, their bone metabolism and to optimize it. Um, other thing is the, there are more um, bone corridors which can be in bone angles and trajectories can be used from before. So if something has compromised one, one direction of a screw, there are others rescue techniques and strategies which can be used. So it, I'm not saying that everything is possible, but uh, the, in case of failure, there are many more, uh, many more solutions that were available 10 years ago. Uh, I'm sure we're going to have some questions for you, Paul, but let me ask you a question first myself. 
Now, what you said makes perfect sense. The experience translates into better outcomes. But how do you know as a patient how much experience your doctor has? I mean, do you just look at the color of their hair or presence of hair or do you look uh, at their self, you know, self-promotion is, on is the website? You know, you know, how well, do you know? The, the only people who really know how good the surgeon is are the scrub nurses. <laughs> because nobody else knows for sure. You know, like, uh, um, for example, there are people who publish a lot. Um, you know, sometimes they have, um, you know, they have a big machinery for, for publishing and they have a lot of residents doing the surgery, but they do not have the direct experience. Um, other, other people who are, for example, in prior practice, they, they do not have the resident, but they also do not have quaternary hospitals. Um, so, it, you know, it, what it counts probably the best is the word of mouth of the patients. Um, you know, the, the patients do not know if the technique is, you know, is uh, up to snuff or brand new or old or whatever. But out of 100 patients, for example, if all of them, uh, you know, all of them had complications, had to go back uh, or they fell apart, you know, whatever, like, I remember that when I started with Mira doing, taking care of these cases, uh, we did not, you know, nobody was telling us because there was no article, no book about the problems the EDS people had, and we had to learn about it. Uh, so the outcomes we had 20 years ago are not similar to the outcomes we have now. Other thing is uh, the, what is the realistic expectation you're giving to the patients? Um, for example, very often patients come to the door and they ask me, ah, you know, my dysautonomia is going to heal after the fusion. And I tell them, I've done 1,100 uh, craniosurgical fusion in my career. And I only had the dysautonomia disappearing in only five patients. In all the others in which the surgery was successful, the dysautonomia improved a bit, but did not disappear. So if you, if you have... Uh, if you set up the, the expectations away from kind of something magic which happens to you, which has never ending, uh, never end, causes never ending improvement, that point is going to be a, uh, is going to be a good relationship. Other thing is that, you know, somebody has, uh, EDS has problems with wound healing. Fine, you know, like uh, I've been working with plastic surgeons, and the plastic surgeon was working with me for ten years, has graduated by repeated experience as a as an EDS expert. So he has learned the ropes by yeah, he has learned on the street. Uh, like, but there is no uh, plastic surgery uh, EDS fellowship out there. But if you operate on EDS patients. You know, um, I do something like between this year, I'm going to do 300 cases. And uh, my plastic surgery guy is always there for each and one of them. So, you know, it doesn't take a, a long time for, for, with that kind of exposure, for somebody who just comes in with the right attitude to develop a big experience. It so makes once, yeah. once you set up these things and you say, all right, you have EDS, this is the way you're done. There are, I'm going to maximize, I'm going to try to minimize the risk for you to have a complication because I'm going to have a plastic surgeon, et cetera. I'm going to give you this. You're going to stay with the stitches instead of just seven days. You're going to stay for it between three weeks and four weeks. Uh, but despite all these things, minimizing doesn't mean limiting. So... Yeah, yeah, I think the, 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 the advice to, to ask scrub nurse is a great one, but I think it's even better to ask a rehab doctor who sees the patients after surgery. So the, when, you, yeah, when you want yeah. to know whose patients need rehabilitation and who don't, that's probably a better example. But, but I think you're right about word of mouth, and I think we look at the Google to, for reviews, and I can tell you that, you know, majority of reviews are negative because people who do well, they don't write anything. They're just happy. People who don't yeah, do they, well, they write a lot. So they, uh, yeah, so, yeah, so yeah, it, we just it, can encourage the point. patients when they are thankful, just, just make sure you thank your doctor, somebody like yourself, who's, uh, 
who can then generate even more referrals based on your good experience. We have a question from the audience. Give me just a second. Dr. Bolognese, it's John. Mustache looks good. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Thank Hi. you so much for uh, presenting. I think you are brilliant. Um, and my question is about myself, so it's okay at any time if you want to say that's okay. You can use a word. Instead of no, you can make it safe, like Apple. That's very safe. Um, so I developed signs of myelopathy and cranial nerve uh, imp impaction that were intermittent. At least my symptoms were intermittent. I still have ho positive Hoffman's. And I asked to, um, I went through your process, I'm going through your process, uh, where I um, asked for your opinion on paper. But I really feel like I can't put to rest my, um, my thoughts on how prepared I feel about surgery until I speak with you about your potential um, plan for, for if I were to go to surgery. Now, my symptoms have improved quite a bit, and you, your uh, system has an incredible gatekeeping uh, structure, and I also feel bad taking your time as a patient because I am in not in the, the, the distress that your other cases are in. But I really feel like um, if I have this opportunity to ask you if you're available to talk to me, that I should take it. <laughs> oh, no, no, so it's okay. Like, uh, first of all, you raise some points that I want to, to elaborate. If you um, if you want to, to talk, you know, in birth, the only thing you have to do once you receive the initial evaluation is just to talk to the, uh, to my staff for, for a follow-up. We're going I to did. have an extensive conversation. That's good. I did. I yeah. asked, yeah. and they said you yeah. were not available. I like it's not available now, but okay. if you are patient. <laughs> Can I ask be, them again? Gonna, <laughs> yeah, ask them again. It's going to happen. Um, it's just a matter of traffic. You know, people need to be prioritized. People who are super sick, etc. Um, but you, you were saying something which was, uh, which was the, you know, the, the selection process. The selection process is uh, we're not dealing with people with terminal cancer. The vast majority of the people with uh, instability, cardiac malformation, combination of the two, uh, they. They're not going to die, and they're not going to end up on a wheelchair. So there is the luxury of, you know, taking a deep breath, both from the doctor's part and from the patient's part. And for the vast majority of everybody, even, even if at the end of the yellow brick road, there is a surgical option which you get put on the table, the surgical option is just that. It's an option and should be entertained by the patient when everything else has failed and uh, you know, and at that point, the patient decides that once patient is educated about risk benefits uh, and potential complication, fine. At that point, it makes sense to go ahead. And the selection criteria, which is the other point I want to make, uh, they're both rigid and flexible, and that's a, that's something that was thought to me by my one, one of my mentors. Uh, should be rigid because when you decide that you have permutation X, Y, Z, you should never make an exception. That's the law and that's the law. But they should also be flexible because when after a certain amount of years you realize that you should amend them, it is like the constitution. The constitution is written, but every now and then, you know, something, needs to be added, and we abolish slavery, we do this, we do that, and we do amendments. And the same should be done for the qualification criteria for both diagnostic and surgical qualification. So once we have a body of evidence which tells us we should do an amendment, we do the amendment, but once there is a new version of the selection and qualification criteria, they should be, uh, they should be applied rigidly. Because the moment you start being wishy-washy about it, it is like everybody has lived, you know, this for the last two years. Oh, we live, we, no, no masks. Yes, mask. 
three mask fabric, <laughs> four mask, whatever, and you put the mask in the back, but then you put something, something up the nostril. Once you start being wishy-washy, you're no longer credible. So uh, as, a, as a physician, you know, you cannot expect, especially in this, in, in, with this discipline that is far from being ultimately defined, you cannot say, ah, oh, the science is rigid. The hell did it is. Uh, things that I was doing about this patient population 20 years ago, I no longer do them, you know, and, and, and things that we're doing a certain way, now doing it differently. So you cannot be so stupid as a physician to say, I have all the answers and uh, when I have them now, and this is the ultimate version. And we have to realize science is a process. I completely understand that. And I know that when you open somebody up, it's different than any plan. But because I know that there's such a wide range of um, options for decompression. Do you cauterize the tonsils? Do you leave them alone? Do you do duroplasty? How much of the posterior fossa do you remove? I clearly have a background in medicine. Um, so no, about, all, about all... that, the, about that, there is a there is a spectrum of maneuvers available. You can go from just cutting some bone to the nuclear option, which is that one of cutting the tonsils. And the spectrum is what it is. But from Patient to patient, not everybody has a standard carrier malformation. So if somebody has a nasty anatomy of carrier malformation, you already know from the beginning as a doctor that if you're going to do just the bony decompression, you're not going to, it's kind of right. going to be doomed from the start. And on the other end, the, the, which is the most radical approach, also should be, you know, I did not start doing tonsillectomies. Uh, in my career until I had at least 600 or 700 cases under, under my belt. At that point, I allowed myself to push my limit to go there because it was not, you know, it's not, a, it's not an easy technique, sub-technique, and is, uh, is dangerous if it is in the hands of somebody who's, uh, who's not experienced enough. So, like, um, so I was... I had that kind of prolonged adolescence. Maybe I should have waited less, you know, whatever. But if somebody has less than 50 cases of experience and starts already with a tonsillectomy, yeah, you can get lucky once, you can get lucky twice, but you're not going to get lucky the third time in a row. Thank you so much for agreeing to. That, that was great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Paolo. Welcome. Any other questions? Oh. Okay, I do have some more. Um, so you do resection and cauterization. Um, so when you practice resection, blood in the brain is a very serious risk. Um, what's the difference between the two techniques? Is it simply that you're cauterizing for a very long time? Okay, two things. Uh, the, the tonsillar resection, uh, is not a radical resection. You just resect up to, you can resect safely up to two thirds of the, of the tonsils. And the tonsils do not have practically, um, you know, a neurological function. So you can resect up to two thirds of the tonsils without causing problems. Okay, and if you go all the way, the limit, upper limit of the tonsils, the swelling is gonna extend to the lower part of the cerebellum and it's going to create an issue. So um, what's the difference with coagulation? Coagulation, you just cook the outside of the tonsil. And you can cook the back of the tonsil, which is what is facing you, the back and the medial bank, the back and the medial bank in the, in the lateral aspect. And you can also dissect the arachnoid bands and cook the anterior surface of the tonsils once you dissect them off the brainstem which is way, way a much more involved thing. So I, practically you can cook the filet mignon in, in each and every one of the surface available. Uh, one of the things that I've, I've noticed with my surprise is that uh, the less you cook in terms of surface, the higher the chance that actually the superficial vascularization of the tonsil could regenerate itself. 
which was oh, yeah a, a big surprise for for me and Mirad when we saw it the first time. We do not know how many times it happens. That was just the episodic uh, thing that we see it happen, but we've seen it enough times happening that it was not a surprise after a while. Obviously, the moment you start, the more you cook, the less the chance that that is going to happen. Tons of resection, you know, you, you cook not only the surface, but you cook also the inside. And then you suck the mushy tissue that is dead inside once you once you're totally done. Um, different ways than what you do with the, with, with, the, with the rest of the stump. And there are different techniques you can do. But, you know, it can be, you can push the technique as much as it is um, proportion to the level of experience. And you should never, uh, you know, we're not talking about a cardiac transplant. Cardiac transplant, if you forget to connect one pipe, the patient dies. So you better do it from A to Z, period. There is no alternative. Here, you know, you can just cook a little bit. Uh, you can cook 360 degrees the tonsil, which is still different degrees of uh, tonsillar coagulation. And, uh, you know, what's the anatomical result? Then, uh, you know, it, it's always the doctor's prerogative to decide what's the risk benefit ratio for the individual patient for that individual anatomy on that day. So overdo it when they, you know, when, for example, that, that thing that I told you before of the decompressing the basal artery of the inferior part of the medulla at the level of the pyramid. I did it once in my entire career. I did 1,600 cases, never seen any other times. But the patient had a severe paralysis, and that was a one in one in lifetime kind of event. So at that point, that degree of being aggressive made sense. And I'm, you know, and she's lucky, and I'm lucky that it happened when I was 62 rather than when I was 42, because I would have had much less experience and forget about the ability to pull it off. And then there is always some kind of luck. And, but that, 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 that makes sense. That, that's, that's the right yeah. way to approach it. So, you know, obviously there's more opinions than there are surgeons, but they, it's, it's, a, it's a great mm -hmm. point that, you know, it has to be done individually and experience definitely counts. So that's... And, and that, there that's, is no one that, surgery fits for all. Right, that's for there sure. There is no one surgery which is superior and should be used like a rubber stamp. And, and that's because why also, you're choosing individually for each patient based on their anatomy, right. on their symptoms, on their history and all these things. And, and that's why your experience becomes important because, you know, in the younger stages of career, you didn't have this wealth of experience and you just could not come up with all these options. So it's, it's it, not... is, it is like when you're a cook, you know, at the beginning, your menu is like this and then it becomes like this and then it becomes like this. You know, you, you are in a diner, you're not going to spend three hours making one dish, but you know, your fiance comes for dinner Yeah, you want to impress her, you're going to do the three hour dish. That's so per that's a per perfect illustration. That's exactly right. So, Paolo, yes. thank you very much oh, for your time. That was very very nice for for all this. You know, it's 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 it's, it's been really really impressive to to hear all this wisdom. And you know, we'll move on and and you know we'll we'll, we'll get in touch and hope to see you in person next time. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye.